那接下来呢，紧接着是我们本次国际研讨会第一场专题演讲《城市心脏地带的艺术》，美术馆在永续景点建立中的角色。让我们掌声欢迎主持人，也是本次国际研讨会的策划，国立台北教育大学文化创意产业经营学系林永能教授。馆长，还有各位远道而来的各国的贵宾啊，大家还有现场的来宾，大家早。那在开始之前呢，呃，请容许我稍微做介介绍一下我们这一次啊，这个国际研讨会的一些目的哦、啊。那当然，刚刚馆长特别提到啊，今年是北美馆啊这个建馆四十周年。那呃，北美馆是台湾啊这个近现代美术的这个引领者。那当然呢，在四十周年的这个今天呢。那我们特别啊讨论了一下，就是说，那我们哦、啊、北美馆在未来的哪些议题上面啊，希望能够继续哦、啊、引领的台湾的博物馆界跟美术界继续往前走。那所以呢，呃，有提出几个啊我们在啊大会手册看到的三个议题。那所以呢，各位可以看到这些啊相关的议题呢，其实跟传统的美术馆的这个研讨会事实上有一点点不一样啊。所以我们从这个啊、呃，我们的邀请的贵宾啊，跟投稿的这个议题来看啊，就可以看到，就是说我们更扩大了啊，在整个美术馆的这个议题的这一种讨论。那所以呢，我想哈、啊，这个大概是我们啊这一次研讨会的一个主要的一个目的。那在第一场的 keynote 的这个演讲呢，我们是请到了 Professor Mike Robinson。那 Mike 呢，他是国际间非常知名的啊文化观光的研究的学者。那他曾经出过啊。的这个上百本的啊，这个呃书籍啊，跟呃编过哦非常多的这一种学术期刊。那同时呢，他也啊协助 UNESCO 啊进行非常多的这一种所谓的世界文化遗产的评估的这种工作。那同时呢，啊也曾经帮啊好几个国家啊建立所谓的这一种文化路径，或以美术馆为主的啊一种城市发展的这样子的一种策略。所以呢，啊在今天呢，麦克他要从。啊，这个一个美术馆啊，在城市里边应该扮演什么角色？然后跟啊社区应该有些啊什么样的互动为题啊，来跟啊大家进行讨论。那我们就以热烈的掌声啊，欢迎我们啊第一场的啊这个啊 k i n o 的演讲者呃、啊、Professor Mike Robinson， 谢谢。谢谢林永南教授的语言，谢谢。Well, Director Wang. Esteemed colleagues, it is my great honour、um, to be invited to you、uh, to here to、uh, speak at this 40th anniversary conference.、Um, uh, I've had a look through the programme, and it is a rich and fascinating programme, and I'm very excited、um, uh, to be listening to see what everybody has to has to say.、Um, my topic.、Um, uh, I'm going to talk about art museums, but really, it can be any museum. And I'm very passionate about the role of art in wider society. And I want to talk about, and I want to remember this this word heart when we talk about our heart. And I remember when I first came to Taiwan many years ago, the Tourist authority had a slogan called "Taiwan, touch your heart," and this is an old-fashioned thing now. But、uh, I, I think it's a really nice reflection about how art does indeed do something for our emotions. Now, for me, art is beauty. And beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but nevertheless, I think some, it's something that we need in the world more than ever now. We have war, we have climate change, we have many problems、uh, in the world, but art somehow gives us some inspiration. Now I put up a famous quotation by the、um, Irish poet and author, playwright Oscar Wilde, and very famously he said, "All art is quite useless." And what he really meant there is, 
we don't really need art in our lives, but it makes our lives worth living. In the same way, we don't really need love in our lives. We don't need wine. We don't need to drink wine, but drinking wine and being in love is something which makes us human. But I would also like to argue that art can be very useful and something that we do really need. Now, ever since we value art, anything we value can be bought and sold. And there's always been a market for art. And art has always been commercialized in various forms, whether we like it or not. And you just have to stroll around the streets of Paris or other great cities to see that art is economy. For some people, it is a way of living, of making a living, but also as a way of enjoying our humanity. But it's become ever more important at regional, national, local level for economic development. And we're all familiar now, I think, with what's become known as the Bilbao effect. Now, I've worked in Bilbao. Um, I know the city very well. An old industrial city in the, uh, the northeast of Spain. And of course, it came to prominence in the 1980s with uh, Frank Gehry's Guggenheim construction. Now, we have to put this in context. My question is would there have been a Guggenheim? if the economy of Bilbao was still successful as an industrial economy. Bilbao used to make ships. It used to produce iron and steel for, for, for Europe. But with the decline of that economy, it's changed and art, culture, the cultural economy, has overtaken this to fuel the economy. It's very interesting because in some ways, this museum is a recognition of failure. It's a recognition of industrial decline. But at the same time, it has undoubtedly reinvigorated the city. But I would point out that this incredible structure, for every one person which goes into the Guggenheim Museum, to look at the art and look at the exhibits, a hundred people just stand outside taking photographs of it. But of course we build, and we are still building art museums in different parts of the world for different reasons. So the... Um, uh, this is the, um, the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, in Qatar. And it's built as a statement of a culture. It's based, as a, it's, it's based in a fairly um, uh, different culture from, from what we are used to. And it's a statement piece. And it's a showing off of wealth. In the same way, that the the structure on this side it's in New, it's in uh, Mexico City and it's the um, uh, the museum uh, Sumaya and um, uh, it costs seventy million pounds and it's there to host the art collection of a Mexican billionaire and what I what I have to remind myself and my, when, when, and, and, and my colleagues, I say, well, you know, it's an incredible structure. It has an incredible art collection. 
43% of the population of that city lives in poverty. So that is a symbol of something almost unattainable. But we build that, we still build museums and adapt museums for good, re for, for good reasons. This is the Tokyo National Art Center, built for education and research. It's an important motivation still. So we are building museums, still art museums, for different reasons. And sometimes we have to look at those, those reasons. This isn't a very clear photograph. I'm sorry at the quality of the photograph, but this is a, I think this exemplifies the change which has taken place. This is a small town in the north of France called Lons. And if you see at the top here, you will see two pyramid structures. That is the monument to the industrial past of this town. This town would not have existed without coal mining. And now the coal mining has long gone. And this town is a very, was a very depressed area. Lots of people unemployed. And here at the front, we see the new economy. This is the, the Louvre. This is the Louvre of Lens. This is the way that the Louvre has taken itself outside of Paris and constructed itself in a very depressed area of France. Now, there is an argument, and maybe I can talk later if we have time, about the success of this and how this actually manifests itself in the community because I, I did some work here a few years ago. It was very, very interesting. But nevertheless, it was a strategic decision to put a branch of the Louvre, which obviously has got an international reputation, in a tiny mining town in the north of France. We see this in many parts of the, of the world now. This is uh, the Turner Gallery in a small seaside town in the southeast of England. A very depressed town. Nobody went there. And they have built this new gallery to mark the artistic achievements of, um, of Joseph William Turner. So again, it is having a, a regenerative effect on the community. We would hope so. So art museums have become an instrument, let's say, of cultural economic development. They are not always strategic. Again, there are different motivations behind the construction of art museums and different approaches. And I try and some of these approaches up in different ways. So the, what the first approach is build it and the people will come. So this is a, a physical development strategy. Now, I see this at work in China. I work in China. The China has produced many, many museums recently. Almost a, a museum a week at one time was opening across China. Wonderful structures. And my question was always, where is the content? What's, what, what, what are these, what is the hope? There's a lot of hope and expectation on building these architectural icons. Then there is the strategy of devolution, which again is what the Louvre has been trying to do. Um, uh, in, in the UK, they have opened a branch of the Victorian Albert Museum in Scotland. It's a way of devolving the, um, uh, the, the, not just devolving the, the content, but devolving this in terms of its, uh, culturally economic importance. And then we have the importance of branding. Really important. Um, so you have um, uh, the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, you know, or the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi. 
It's, it's using the brand. And that's another strategy in a sense. And then we've had this for quite a while. And, you know, I was, um, I'm, I'm old enough to remember um, a very famous exhibition in, um, uh, in, in, in the British Museum in 1972, the Tutankhamun exhibition. Um, uh, and nobody had ever seen an international exhibition like this before where people are queuing in the thousands to get to see an exhibition. And we have many high-profile exhibitions, the Monet exhibition, the Da Vinci exhibition. Uh, wonderful. But do they really change anything? What is the legacy of those exhibitions? People come, they see it, they go. What is the legacy? So I think we have to think about success and how we evaluate success. But also, how does any of this contribute to the sustainable development agenda, which just about every part of the planet has signed up to? And we have 17, the United Nations set 17 sustainable development goals to reduce poverty, to increase education, to, to be fair to to women, to increase our water quality, all of these, all of these things. What's the contribution? In terms of success, and I'll go through these fairly quickly, it's actually easier to measure impacts of building a museum or an art gallery from new, from the start, because you have a clean piece of paper. The problem is very few people do that. So it's obviously difficult to disentangle, to, de to deconnect the novelty value of, some, of, a, of, a, of a big museum from the long-term impact. And there again, what is long-term? How long do we give um, a project before we say it's a success or otherwise? And also, as I mentioned with the, the Guggenheim and Bill Howe, how do we disentangle the architecture from the content? And how do we differentiate impacts on different audiences? Because we have to think about who is the audience. And of course, most of the time, the audience who come to mu museums and galleries, they're, they're already established art lovers. But what about the local community? What about domestic? And if you are using this in a, in a, in a, in a, for the development of cultural economy, what about international visitors? And how do we disentangle impacts from um, uh, other marketing initiatives? How can we be sure that it's really just the the museum or the new gallery, which is attracting people. Maybe there are other things um, in the equation. Also, and this is a very big interest of mine, I was, I was um, a director of the Ironbridge Institute, um, a World Heritage Site in the UK for 10 years. And we had 10 museums, a collective of 10 museums. And we were Europe's largest independent museum which meant we received no government funding. All of the funding had to be generated by ourselves. But most museums depend on public sector funding. But in times of crisis, in times of pressure, the first budget to be cut by any government is the cultural budget. So it exposes us. And also, who makes the assessment? And sometimes we use um, uh, the evaluations to, um, uh, for our own purposes. And that's, that's normal human behavior in a sense, but it doesn't really get us very far. Just some reflections on the concept of sustainable communities. When we talk about sustainability, we tend to think about environmental sustainability. 
But at the base of this is economic sustainability. The biggest problem we have in the world is poverty, global poverty. So economic regeneration of communities is a critical goal of sustainable development. There are rich parts of the world, poor parts of the world. Rich parts of the city, poor parts of the city. This powerful geographical dimension to regeneration, I think, is really interesting. And I'll, I'll try and illustrate this in a moment. But it isn't just about economic improvement. It's also about quality of life. It's about the useless things in the world, which make our lives worth living. And I also think it's about harnessing the creativity of communities. I'm always so impressed by the creativity that I find in the smallest parts of the world. At the moment, I'm working in a remote part of the desert in, in Uzbekistan. The people, the local communities there are incredibly creative. And we need to try and harness that. And with all of the, I mean, with all of the definitions, the academic definitions of sustainability in sustainable communities, the, the definition I like the most is a sustainable community is somewhere where people want to live and others want to visit. So art can play a leading role in creating sustainable communities. But most of the time, we have been talking, or I have been talking about buildings. And my question is, where is the art? Where does this come into it? And how do we engage with art? Do we really understand that way of engagement? We think we do. I'm not so sure. And where is the genuine creativity of how we can use that art? And very playfully, I've put up um, uh, um, uh, Salvatore Mundi, the attributed Leonardo da Vinci um, painting, which was sold in 2017 for $450 million. And nobody's seen it since. It was reputedly brought by the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, and it's that, that artwork has gone from the world, in a sense, which is rather ironic. Sometimes when I talk to local people and, and people in my own community, and we talk about art museums, this is what, this is the imagination. The art museum has been remote unobtainable for people. It's somewhere they cannot get to. There are exceptions, of course. Um, and I refer to this as the, the museum island effect. So what you have within an art museum is a, is a concentration of creative material but also the expertise, the research, the education, and all of the benefits which go with it. But it's located in one place. And sometimes that place is difficult to get to, not just physically, but intellectually. And I, I've, again, if you don't know where this place is, this, this is a, this is a Alcatraz prison. In, uh, of the, in San Francisco, island prison. And I, I have this idea that we have lots of hidden and trapped objects which are difficult to share with the world because they are locked away. As you know, about uh, in many art museums, 80% of the collections is, are never seen. They're in storage. I work with a museum uh, um, uh, in Uzbekistan at the moment, a wonderful collection of 90,000 artworks. Only 4% are on display. 
and the rest have real big storage issues. This island effect is very visible here as well. This is in London. In the 19th century, the uh, husband of Queen Victoria at the time, um, uh, Prince Albert, decided to concentrate the museums. So here we have the National History Museum, the Victorian Albert Museum, National Science Museum, all within, you've got the Albert Hall there, all within a very small area of London, the most exclusive part of London. But this is just the rich part of London. This is the normal London. How do they have access to these places? And, you know, where where is the art here? You know, where is the... Uh, if you go back to... You know, and if you visit the Victorian Albert Museum, it's full of international visitors. It's free. National museums in the UK are free. Even if there's a lot of art on shore, we reduce it. So the, the Louvre in, in, in Paris has 380,000 pieces in its collection. It only shows 35,000, so less than a tenth. But even out of that 35,000, what do we get when we look at the guidebooks or, or, or open the web browser? We get the 10 must-see treasures. And so it's not surprising that the average length of time for an international tourist visiting the Louvre is only just over two hours. If you're an art historian or an archaeologist, you can spend weeks in the Louvre. But for, for a, an international visitor, that's what they go and see. So we are reducing this all of the time. The art is squeezed out in a sense. And I really don't know what happens here. When I see people, I, I you know, I, I, I work as an anthropologist, so I, I, I observe what's happening. So when I walk around a gallery, I'm always looking at the interactions or what's happening. Where is the relationship? What is the relationship here? Is this a real love of art and appreciation of art? Or if we go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, this is what we see. This is more about appreciating our own egos. We have a selfie with the Starry Night. And we say, we have been there. At this point, I would ask some more questions. Do we really understand how audiences encounter and engage with art and how this changes? How do we understand how museum space is negotiated? by the audience? How do we understand the needs of the wider community? Like any other institution, we are locked in our bubble. We talk about art, we live and breathe art, but there's another world out there. So what role can art museums play in building sustainable communities? And there's a moral question here, which is, uh, I. Uh, it's something to think about. Is it really the responsibility of the art museum to contribute to sustainable communities? Is that not the job of the Department of Economic, the Ministry of Economic Development? Or, you know, I think it is. It, there is a moral responsibility there. Partly because the, most of these are publicly funded. So I would suggest that art museums are actually and should be leaders in building sustainable communities. And when I talk about the heart, if you think about the heart, yes, the heart is located in one place, but the job of the heart is to send blood around the body so it reaches every part of the body, every part of the community. Now, we, we, there are various strategies that are, are being developed for this. We have art festivals. They're one way of trying to get people involved, communities involved. But in my experience, well, one thing is they're an event. They come and they go. 
The other thing is, they tend to just attract the lovers of art. So, there's restrictions there. How about bringing art into different spaces and different communities? Really reaching out and putting art, moving it from the island and putting it in the community. Now, I'm not suggesting that we put a Vermeer or a Mona Lisa in the middle of a, a social housing estate, you know. But there are other options. One way of doing this is to rethink access and location. And this is, this is still a wonderful example. This is the um, uh, wonderful gallery. And where is it? It's in the Schiphol Airport Museum in Amsterdam. So you don't have to go to the Rijksmuseum to see wonderful art. You're in the airport. When you've got catching a flight, you can go and see the wonderful paintings. And it's good advertising for the Rijksmuseum because hopefully people will then go and spend more time in the Rijksmuseum. I like the idea, and I have tried this at a local level, about putting objects from the museums that I used to be responsible for into hotels. I'm not talking about expensive objects. You have to be realistic about this. But, you know, and that's a, it's a way of advertising. But it's also putting this into wider public display. Art hotels. I'm a big fan of art hotels. They've grown recently over the years. I have a, um, uh, somebody who's working on a project for me at the moment looking at the role of art hotels in different parts of the uh, of, of cities and different parts of the world. This one happens to be in Pennsylvania. But you can go and look at art in a hotel. You can actually buy some of the art and new art, you know, local artists are featured in the hotel. It's just a very, you know, normal, normalized way of doing this without having to go to the island. This is in Budapest. This is the Van Gogh Cafe. For most people, they will never get to go to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And obviously, you know, but this is a, this may inspire them. And there are lots of themed cafes now, which I think are, are a really uh, good idea. And then we have what I call the Banksy phenomenon. Now, nobody knows who Banksy is, but he has done so much to bring art and visitors into the very marginal areas of communities, places where people would never, ever go through his public artworks, transformed communities who now have an appreciation and love of art because it's there on their concrete wall or the side of a house. And this is a shop. It's not really a shop. It's a, it's a, a, it, it, well, it's in the premises of a shop. This is in the a place called Croydon in the outskirts of London, place where nobody would ever go. But everybody's going because Banksy has his uh, exhibits. And you can look through the, the, the shop window and you see the queues of people to see this. Street art has become very important. Um, uh, this is a little town in, in Vancouver Island off the west coast of Canada, um, uh, which again had a crisis. It, it lost its paper making, um, uh, its logging facilities. Everybody was unemployed. So what did the community do? They started to paint everything in the town. And now people visit this place. It's called Cheminus in uh, Vancouver Island. Everywhere goes there to look at the murals. They're constantly changing. It harnesses local creativity. Um, it's very popular with tourists. And it tells the story also particularly of the indigenous community there as well. And there are many examples of this. This is the work of Edgar Muller. Edgar Muller is a German street artist. 
He goes into ordinary spaces and transforms them with these spectacular three-dimensional sort of artworks. And people appreciate these things. So, I think there are great opportunities for art museums and art to contribute more to sustainable societies, sustainable communities. But it requires a leap, a jump, outside of the usual space, outside of the, um, uh, the usual way of thinking and engaging with the, art, the audience that we are usually safe about, which is uh, people who like art. Now, partnerships are key to this. Um, uh, and when I talk about partnerships, sometimes um, uh, I've worked with many um, art museums and museums generally uh, over the past 40 years. Um, and when I talk about partnerships, oh, yes, we have a partnership. And I say, well, well, who's your partnership with? With another art museum. Well, that's very safe. And I think we need to be a little bit, bit more uh, ad adventurous with our partnerships. So one way is to look at, at the sub-branches of museums, of this devolution effect, um, uh, and being very strategic about it. Another way is to look at how we can use different display spaces. With, um, uh, Working where, where, working where communities actually exist. Um, uh, and also with them, uh, whether these are in the public sector or whether these are privately owned. One of the museums I was uh, involved with was a museum of, of tiles, decorative tiles, 19th century tiles. And a um, uh, wonderful museum. But in our store, in the store, we had 180,000 tiles. So I was taking those tiles and giving them, deaccessioning in them, um, uh, and putting them in hotel foyers. So people could see the tiles, and then people would come then to the museum to, to learn about their history. Pop-up exhibitions, these are low-cost. And they can be well placed in different spaces. And again, thinking where are the poorer communities? And we can do this with creative learning programs. Again, working with hotels, department stores, airports, um, uh, uh, cafes. Um, deaccessioning is a problem. All museums have problems with deaccessioning objects. Um, but it's a very, I, I, Give another speech recently in Paris where I was talking about how many objects do we really need in the museum? How many objects can we cope with? You know, without having to build another storage facility. Um, and also, I think, innovative use of the museum brand. And I think that can be very important for um, uh, new product development. So, in the spirit of this conference, which is about new vision, a new mission, and a focus on the art museum, the way that I would like to think about the art museum is as an institution which is integrated into all aspects of sustainable development. As a repository of research, skills, and knowledge, which of course they are, but as a repository of objects to be shared at the maximum. As a center for art skills development. So it's about not just learning about art and how to appreciate it, or how to read it, how to understand it, but also learning how to do it, and what it can be used for, going back to that use idea. But also as a source of arts-related business advice. 
So if, a, if somebody from the community says, well, I really want to be involved and set up a, um, a, a small business, maybe in producing something or um, opening a cafe or whatever, can they come to the art museum and actually get advice and, and help to say, well, you know, maybe think about a themed cafe or an art, you know, using the art as inspiration for business and development. And certainly as an entry point to international connections. Um, this is just incredibly important because, again, this is the way of generating real cross-cultural understanding. And I, I'm, I'm afraid to say that, you know, we don't do that enough. We talk to ourselves. We preach to the converted. Um, but we are a very globalized society. We are a multicultural society. We have to think about how we reach out beyond not just our own area, but how we reach out into other, other cultures. And as a distributor for national and international visitors. We all would like international visitors. International visitors bring income into a country, into a community. Um, and they bring many other benefits as well, and again, in terms of cross-cultural understanding, etc. But how do we, how can we then sort of push them in directions to go in other parts of the city or other parts of an area to see things? You know, one of the things I, I used to like to do in the museum I was uh, involved with as we had a very um, um, beautiful set of landscapes. And I, I arranged that people who came to the museum could then visit, an, an, through an organization, visit the same landscapes as they are now and think about the inspiration that went behind the paintings, but also look at the problems of how the landscape has changed. So again, it was a, a, a way of distributing visitors. And, as I mentioned, not as just the center of things, but a beating heart. Something which sort of sends messages, blood flowing, life flowing through the whole of a community to make it sustainable. So thank you very much for your attention. You've been very patient. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Michael Robinson. 那现在呢，紧接着是我们的 Q&A 时间，欢迎各位与会来宾提问。谢谢 Mike， 非常呃精彩的演讲哈。那先从呢啊、呃、这个美术馆呢，它能够在不同的城市当中所扮演的角色，那谈到呢，就是我们应该去思考、哦、我们的观众，然后同时呢，也介绍呃不同的呃这一种。嗯，美术馆怎么介入啊、哦？这个所谓的社区，然后让哦社区能够成为一个永续发展的啊、哦、这样子的一个地方。那因为时间关系，我们接受两个提问，那是不是呃这个呃我们有那麻烦我们两位呃就一起提问？那提问的时候麻烦就是大概一分钟左右哈、哦。来，我们有一位先生，那不知道还有没有另外一位？那来我们先请。哎，感谢 r o b i n s o n 先生的一个视野。你从心脏提提到了永续与社群啊，那你的概念其实才一开始提的时候是有启发的，有艺术即是美感的思考。那在就像刚才馆长的致辞，他反而提到的是当代现象、当代观念跟社会议题。我想问的是当代性的。问题或者说当代艺术的思考，在国际上，你们怎么认定当代艺术的范围？因为这跟你提的过程的很多案例，其实都是从很实在的美感的推动，或者你讲的血液、心脏的全身化、全社区化，可是你并没有以社区议题或者社区性、现实主义作为范畴，那你如何界定？国际上认为的当代性是什么？谢谢。Okay, thank you for your question. 
when we talk about the scope, I don't see there's any limits here. Um, uh, I really don't see why we should set limits on our reach, our potential reach. Um, uh, it varies on a case by case basis, but you know, at the moment, you know, there is a lot of good work going on. I've tried to show some some good practice, but and I don't distinguish between contemporary art, visual art. Uh, it's art. It's, it's <laughs> You know, we can have a long, a big debate about this, but you know, for me, it's 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 art, it's creativity, it's it's, it's genuine works of imagination, and and I think you know, we just need to be aware that there is there is a role for this within every aspect of human life. One, uh, just to give you an example, another project I was involved in. Um, uh, Using artifacts from a museum to take into the um, uh, the care homes for dementia patients. My father had dementia for eight years, um, and one of the things which used to get him talking was if I brought him some old objects from the Second World War. And he would start talking about it. It was the transformation was fantastic. So there is a link between sort of mental health and art. There is a link between all types of health and art. There is a link between you know a, a small cafe in a very small part, very rundown part of the town. Um, uh, yeah, you know, art art can have a role to play, but you 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 have to go there. You can't expect people. To come to your island, you you know you, you have to disseminate and disseminate to different audiences. So I don't see any boundaries whatsoever for this. Uh. Hi, good morning, uh, Professor Mai. I really, really like your presentation. Um, and I have some question related to the picture that you show um, about some people that are taking picture in the art museum. Um, because, like, I have a lot of questions. Um, if you meet that uh, situation, uh, I would love to ask, like, how do you deal with that and how to, how a museum can increase the target visitor who appreciate um, art to visit the museum. And I also have another question. Um, do you think that it's also a strategy for a museum to attract um, people who like to living in social media or to show um, arts in social media to in turn attract people who appreciate art to visit the museum? And that is my question. Thank you. Well, thank you for your for your questions, both interesting questions. With regard to the first question, you cannot control human behavior. People are people, and they come across art in different ways. And um, uh, I, I, again, as a, as an observer, as an, as an ethnographer, I, I, I really, you know. I'm always fascinated how how people react. You know, I've seen people in in the in the Prada or in the Fitzy Gallery, surrounded by the most beautiful objects of, 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 in the world, and they just walk on by, or they quickly take a photograph and walk on by, and maybe that photograph never gets seen. But the thing is, we don't know. We don't really know because other people come across art, maybe later on in their life and they remember these things or they come across art in popular culture or on social media i mean it links to your second question in a sense you know because we can we don't we don't have to now we don't have to go to the museum the difference between you know the great bastions of museums in the 19th century the national museums is that you physically had to go into 
the museum to see anything. We don't have to do that. And one of the things that COVID did, we had this explosion of virtual museums. So, and of course, everybody's digitizing their whole collections. And in a sense, you know, there's no reason to go to the, to, 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 to the museum or gallery. Maybe we have to be a bit more creative about getting people back there and giving them something different, a different experience or adding to their experience. But in some ways, just to, to go on to your second question, the social me media, if you want to argue about it, it's, it's a very, very good form of advertising. It's an incredible form of advertising. I have got no problem. Some museums still have a strategy saying no photographs. I don't care. You know, that's, that's old fashioned now. You, everybody has a mobile phone. Everybody takes a photograph. And it may be 20 years time and you, you discover your photograph and it may inspire you. Or you may look at another painting by the same artist. But, you know, human behavior is very, very difficult to read. But we need to understand it more, I think, within the space of the um, of, 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 of the gallery environment. 好，谢谢。因为时间关系哦，我们这个场次要到这边哦告一段落。那刚刚呃，麦克所提到一些议题呢，事实上也会哦，在我们三天的议程当中有不同的场次会讨论啊、哦、这些相关的议题。那甚至我们在最后一天呢，哦也也会有去到社区里面呢去看我们北美馆所推动的一些啊、哦、这种跟社区之间的这种互动。那我们哦这一场就到这一边，那我们再次以热烈掌声谢谢我们的呃主讲者啊，谢谢林永能教授 ，Thank you, Professor Michael Robinson。